Hello and welcome to the Katie Halper Show. So excited to be here with you. Uh, we got a great show for you today and I'm just so excited. It's jam-packed. It is our final show of 2023. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be great. So let me give you a little layout of the show. First, we have on three activists who interrupted Richie Torres. Then we have on Palestine-based journalist Yumna Patel. And then we have on uh, Sam Biagetti, the historian. So before I start that, though, make sure you like the stream. Give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to the stream. Also, make sure you are a Patreon supporter because if you're watching this now, you get to see the whole thing live. If you're watching this later, part of this will be Patreon only. And to access it, that's at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Uh, Patreon, if you're Patreon members, you get a great chat that I did with Saeed Arakat, the Palestinian journalist, where we discuss things like Yemen and Bill Maher. That's a Patreon only. Uh, also, if you're a Patreon supporter at the $1 level, you just help make this show happen because we literally could not do the show without um, your support. So first things first, though, we are bringing on uh, Richie Moreno, uh, Richie Marino, who is an organizer, a uh, New York City public school teacher in the South Bronx and an anti-imperialist activist and organizer with the Bronx Anti-War Coalition. We're bringing on Jason Rosenberg, an advocate and organizer with a focus in public health and HIV. He is an ACT UP New York and Reclaim Pride Coalition member and was named in 2020's Logo 30 by Logo TV. And we're going to bring on Alana kruger Khan an anti-Zionist Jewish activist based in Westchester, New York, and a founding member of the Israeli anti-Zionist collective, Shoresh. So, Richie, Jason, and Alana, welcome. You're all muted. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you. Tell us how this uh, event was organized. What made you think of doing this event in the first place? Why did you want to do it? Jason, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, it's funny. Uh, so I'm actually a former 92nd Street Y employee. I, I was there for six years. And when a lot started uh, coming into the headlines about um, the 92nd Street Y stripping and canceling um, talks, uh, including Pulitzer Prize winner Vietan Nguyen um, and other writers pulled out as a result because they have called for a ceasefire and an end to the occupation. A lot of us were wondering, you know, how can we protest the why um, for, you know, this really poor decision making that is very similar to McCarthyism era. Um, and this event was kind of handed to us on a platter. Um, it was just the worst type of event platforming the worst type of people, such as um, decision makers, uh, Richie Torres and Mike Lawler. Um, who are both non-Jewish uh, representatives, but are speaking, um, almost speaking for and over uh, Jews um, across New York State. And the idea originally was formed to say, like, a lot of Jews who are blocked by Richie on Twitter, like, what if we disrupted, uh, Katie included, me, myself included, I think uh, a lot of us on the call are, but... Um, but, you know, what if a bunch of Jews who are Black by Richie um, disrupted the event? But then it became this really incredible and um, robust and diverse and just really great crew of people who are both constituents of Richie Torres and Mike Lawler, who are, um, you know, Jews who are Black by Richie, um, who are just really passionate about, um, you know, social justice and an end to this genocide. And why these individuals in, in particular? Because they were actually speaking, right? They they worked on a bill related yeah. to the Abraham Accords. Can right. can you guys explain so, that? Um, Congressman Lawler and Congressman Torres collaborated on what they celebrated as a bipartisan uh, effort um, on behalf of Israel. Um, the Abraham Accords is a political initiative to normalize economic relations between Israel and the Arab countries, the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. Um, this includes things like opening up travel between tourists, civilians being able to go there, um, opening up trade between the countries, which up until now has previously been blocked because there's um, an economic blockade against Israel. 
because of the Palestine issues. So the goal of the uh, Abraham Accords is to override and bypass the Palestine issue politically and economically, which for those of us who are familiar with the boycott and divestment sanctions movement, it's kind of the exact opposite of BDS. It's the attempt to push through Israel and Israeli apartheid as a permanent situation economically and politically with recognition and acceptance by the Arab countries. And it's widely rejected by the people of the Arab countries, but it's widely desired by the leaders of these, like especially the oil nations, because they uh, receive money and aid and funding from the US, political normalization. There's a lot of benefits to be had by these leaders who are looking to um, gain in the world's uh, kind of like uh, neo-colonial, neoliberal oil society. Um, so what Richie Torres and Mike Lawler did was that they, in, in the recent uh, military spending bill that was passed uh, just last week, um, they created a bill uh, a addition to it that uh, d created a special envoy to the Abraham Accords. So it was the development of the like official American uh, envoy, an actual job, so budgeting, money, the, the uh, decision to select somebody to go to the Abraham Accords on behalf of the United States. And I just want to note that the Abraham Accords it, it is a U.S.-led initiative, so that like all along the U.S. has been there. So this is kind of a ridiculous, almost like like a uh, flashy uh, show bill rather than um, any kind of um, any kind of like, um, but yeah, but it's it is substantive because the the larger material effort of the uh, Abraham Accords is substantive, but the way that they're celebrating it as some kind of bipartisan effort when of course we already know that bipartisan uh bipartisanship regarding israel is is mono party there they are unified 100 percent across the board so it's it seems like kind of a throwaway uh thing and then for somebody like richie torres who claims to be progressive to be sitting on stage with michael lawler who happens to be my congressman michael lawler is fairly right-wing a uh, Trump Republican who caucuses with January 6th insurgents. So um, it really just kind of belies any claim that my, uh, Richie Torres makes to bipartisan, uh, to progressiveness. And Michael Lawler makes claims to being the most um, bipartisan voting statistically. Um, congressman, which might be true, but you know, if we're talking about, for example, funding apartheid Israel, fun, uh, funding um, uh, uh, an envoy to the Abraham Accords, it's like, it's not progressive, it's not by, it's not moderate, it's still fairly right wing. So the way the, the language is being deployed by these people to kind of narrow the scope of how things can be talked about, which we saw in the video, Richie Torres makes appeals to being progressive while he sits on the stage with Michael Lawler. Um, it just seems to be a, a really important thing for us to be targeting as activists. Right. One of his favorite talking points is that I'm Richie Torres is, is that I'm I'm uh, I'm pro Israel, not despite my progressive values, but because of my progressive values. So I'm going to uh, ask you another Richie, although spelled differently. Um, Richie, you are actually, I believe, a constituent of Richie Torres. Um, so what made you want to take part in this action? Yes, unfortunately, I am a constituent of Richie Torres. Uh, Richie Torres has been on my radar, I think, as others here have stated as well, for a long time. And that was because when he was running for Congress and I was looking at the candidates that were running, I noticed that Richie Torres' website had no policy positions whatsoever. He, he literally was able to run and win without a policy platform. I, I don't think that you could really, I, I, you know, I guess in the United States, you can do that if you have APAC money. Um, and the his whole campaign, he was like, I'm, you know, the first gay Afro-Latino elected into public office in, in the Bronx. And, you know, and then he, whenever he would speak, it was using a lot of vague rhetoric, like I'm gonna fight for working families, I'm gonna fight for affordable housing. So he would say all these things, but there was never any actual policy to back it up. And then, 
shortly after he was elected, the very first event that he did was a pink washing event with an IDF um, sergeant or something along those lines. And it was really then when it started becoming very apparent to the activists in the Bronx that, you know, we thought that Richie Torres was, was picked for this, for this seat because of his identity. And he was willing to, you know, uh, we, we like to say pimp out his identity. I'm sorry if that is offensive to some people, but that is exactly what Richie Torres is doing. Um, I'm in the Bronx Anti-War Coalition. What, sorry, Richie, can you just, for viewers who don't know, just explain what pinkwashing is? Yeah, so pinkwashing is a PR and narrative strategy employed by Zionists to justify the occupation, justify the apartheid, and now to justify the genocide of, of Palestinians. And the way that they do that is by exploiting the LGBTQ movement and the LGBTQ struggle. So the Zionists will claim that Israel is this you know, progressive democracy. And um, they also portray the Palestinians as being like uniquely homophobic or um, violent towards, towards people of the LGBTQ com community. Um, very recently, there was this group in New York City that got off the ground. I'm not affiliated with them, but they're called Queers for a Liberated Palestine. And they held a, 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 a pretty big march here in New York City for Palestine. Thousands of people showed up and online the Zionists were, uh, you know, quote tweeting pictures and saying, oh, if, if, if you were in Palestine, Hamas would kick you off a, of a rooftop or if you were in Palestine, Hamas would murder you just for being gay, things like that. So it's also the pinkwashing is also used to um, using racist tropes to to, you know, make people feel like this occupation is justified because these are uncivilized people. And, uh, and, you know, it kind of plays into that like white man's burden that the U.S. has historically used to, to justify its colonization. And it's just, it's just a repeat of, of, of that playbook um, in real time. Right. So I'm sorry, I cut you off there. You were saying that oh. you're with the Bronx anti-war. Yeah, I'm with the Bronx anti-war coalition. We, we started last year, so we're a relatively new group. And uh, we started because there was a lot of propaganda around the US NATO proxy war in Ukraine. We really wanted to push back against that. You know, the South Bronx, where I'm from, where I grew up, we suffer from uh, underfunded schools. Our roads and our sidewalks are falling apart. And our, our youth don't have any, any recreation centers to go to, right? So we, our, our group came together and we were saying, hey, instead of sending all of this money for this war in Ukraine, we need that money to be invested in our community. Now, because of um, the, this, the the ramp up of, of this uh, the, of the bombing in Gaza, we've focused all of our attention on that, and we've held various marches and rallies in the in the Bronx in support of Palestine. But we've also held um, uh, speakouts in front of Richie Torres's office, and every single time that we've done that he's shut his office down in order to avoid us. Also, many members in our coalition have uh, called Richie Torres's office, have emailed, and he does not respond. No one in his office responds. Sometimes we'll actually go to his office without announcing anything and it'll be closed, or they'll tell us, no, you need to um, set up an appointment in advance. So they wanna screen you to make sure that you're not somebody that's going to be, you know, uh, opposing anything that he does. So, um, all, a lot of us have also asked for his, um, his, uh, public appearances and they refuse to give that to us. I'm on his mailing list. He never says, Hey, I'm going to be here or, or I'm going to be there. So it's been really hard to find him. And when I heard about this event and the opportunity to confront him in person, you know, I, I jumped on that opportunity because it's, it's been, a, it's been difficult to, to even get a chance to meet with him. Mm. And just going back to the pink washing for a second, something that he said, uh, cause I was there, I went there to document the disruption. Um, 
And I don't have it verbatim, but I found a quote of his in, in another article. And he basically said this more or less uh, at the event as well. He says, I even remember coming across an activist with a shirt that read Queers for Palestine. I remember telling the activist, does the opposite exist? Are there Palestinians for queers? It was partly a joke, but partly a serious observation. I found it utterly baffling that you had LGBT activists doing the bidding of Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that executes LGBT people. And then I came to realize that the reason is intersectionality, that the BDS movement uses intersectionality to penetrate a whole host of self-proclaimed progressive movements. So does any of you want to respond to that claim, um, that assertion? I mean it's it's a fairly noxious and extremely racist claim because first of all of course there are queer palestinians as well and if they live in uh Gaza, if they live in the west bank they're you know they live in societies where they're challenging their their social structures and social norms and so our basis is to be in solidarity with those people and to watch them be to kill them. Um, it, it's for, for all of us who are queer in, in the West, like it's vital responsibility for us to like take up solidarity in defense of people who are being bombed and live in apartheid and to watch, um, you know, like Western queer norms be used as justification and and uh, uh, leveraged as weapon as a political weapon against people who are already extremely vulnerable is um, incredibly devastating and incredibly painful. Um, you know, queer organizing throughout the Arab world is incredible, out, uh, you know, incredibly inspiring. Um, those of us who have been privy to it are, are really lucky and inspired by it in the West as well. Um, and, you know, we recently saw, I think there was a really excellent, excellent um, example of pinkwashing. The, uh, there was a recent photograph from inside Gaza where an Israeli soldier standing on top of the rubble of homes was holding up a pride flag that said something like, love is love. And it's the, the, the dissonance and the disconnect between the, the imagery of Western pride in a mass grave really drives home what pinkwashing is used for. Right. Yeah. And it's, oh, yeah, Jason, go. Yeah. No, and I just like to add that if you even look at, you know, what a lot of this anti LGBTQIA plus rhetoric is, it's rooted in colonialism. So if you want to actually go that route, um, you know, that's where it comes from. And if, you know, I, and I think about it too, who are we in the, who are we meaning like our elected decision makers to, to use pinkwashing? as this weaponization where we now have a speaker who, you know, has in the past tried to criminalize gay sex and who is now trying to, um, you know, use into, exactly, Speaker Mike Johnson. So who, you know, spoke at the Stand With Israel event that um, apparently, uh, you know, grew over 200,000 people and along with Mike Hagee. So, this right. is what an extremely homophobic and anti-Semitic evangelical pastor. Right. Absolutely. So this is, you know, a, a lot of us queer people, we say, where are we safe even? So who, you know, what does it mean to weaponize queerness in this way to exploit our identity and our experience to justify uh, a genocide it is absolutely apprehensible. Also, I've always been so confused. It's like, if you care about LGBTQ people in Palestine, which these people are claiming to do, obviously cynically, do you think that they want to be bombed? I've always wondered about this justification too, because it's like, are we bombing homophobes now? Because there's an entire list of Americans. Right. That we, you know, American officials, not to like advocate for bombing American no, right. officials, We're of not, course, but yeah. it's like, if that's what the argument leads to, like that, that the boils down to they're homophobic, so bomb them, then how, where else can we target that? And so that's why it, it's just on its face, absolutely absurd and utterly racist. Right. But also the other people who get bombed are the, are the queer people in Palestine. Yeah. And the only way that doesn't happen is if you're totally erasing these people, you know, or you're that racist that you actually think that there aren't queer people in Palestine. And I never know which one it is. Who knows what, the, what these people, uh, 
But here's that photo, by the way, that you mentioned, or one of the photos of the pink washing. Let me just uh, show you guys this, this image. So here you have, uh, in the name of love, here's an Israeli uh, This is soldier. exactly the picture I was yeah. thinking about. Oh, it's, I, I, I really, Disgusting. when I look at this, it, it looks like, it looks colonial. You can see how how people envision like Western pride as a colonial mechanism because here we are, this proud so soldier standing on top of the rubble, probably graves, you know, of people in the name of love, written in three languages. You can see it's written in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Right. And he's standing like on neo colonial. On the, yeah. Right. It bombed out gaza background he's standing on the ruins of this and i think that there was a tweet like something you've never a flag you'll never you'll never see in palestine you've never seen before in palestine um and there was another one where there were two men one man was uh proposing like on his knee giving the other one a ring like proposing the irony is you're actually same-sex marriage happens to not be legal in israel anyway but that's kind of uh another point but yeah this is like pink washing in, in one image so I want to ask you guys about your all of your your biographies and like identities and how those intersect with what with the work that you're doing or um, with, with what you are doing around Palestine and also around challenging people like Torres and Lawler. I can start off. So during the the disruption of the, that Taurus event. Um, I did make it a point to say that I'm a I'm a gay Latino because that's you know what he uh, his shtick is that you know if you criticize me then you're being homophobic and and actually he he ran on that as well he said oh the the you know that one of the other top candidates in the race he's a homophobe and and he's attacking me for for who I am and who I love and things like that so I didn't want him to be able to use that against me when I was criticizing him. So I made it very clear, I'm also gay, I'm also Latino. So you can't say that I'm being homophobic or I'm being racist. And what I wanted to highlight as well is that he doesn't speak for the queer community. He's actually really out of touch with the queer community. The queer community for the most part is in solidarity with uh, Palestine and they oppose, you know, the queer community at large opposes um, the genocide that's that's happening in Gaza right now. So it's very infuriating for for queer people to see um, Richie Torres, um, you know, as others have said, weaponizing his identity to justify this this um, this genocide. And um, that's the message that I wanted to put out there when I disrupted. I said, hey, you don't speak for us. You don't represent us. You don't represent the values of the Bronx. You don't represent the values of of, of queer people. Thank you. Yeah, I'll also add too that, um, you know, as like a queer anti-Zionist Jew, like I, I think it's interesting and absurd how Richie has become so comfortable about speaking with authority on Jewish issues. Um, you know, the other night he tried to explain what Hanukkah was. And, you know, as a, as a Jew, I'm like, you know, it's a little weird how comfortable you are uh, talking with authority. You're not a clergy member. You're not Jewish. It's, it's just a little strange. Um, so not this past summer, but the summer before, I actually had a tweet, uh, which surprisingly didn't get me blocked. It was the tweet after this. But um, I, I said to him, I said, I have to say how thoroughly tired I am of spiritual tour speaking on behalf of Jews. I said, there are Jewish New Yorkers that believe that Israel is an apartheid state, that BDS is not anti-Semitic, and do not need a non-Jewish member of Congress smearing people in their name. And this is actually when he went on a smear campaign against Yulene, um, who was running for NY20, which is now Dan Goldman's seat. And he mouthed me off in his own way. But surprisingly, actually not surprisingly, who responded to him was Christina Pushal, who is a top aide of Ron DeSantis. And she said, I wish all Democratic Democrat politicians were more like you. Right. And, and again, I think it's another instance where pinkwashing falls on its face, that he's, you know, mouthing off um, a, a queer anti-Zionist Jewish New Yorker here. 
and uh, the top eight of one of the most homophobic decision makers in our country is applauding him. Right. You know? You know, and I think also to talk about what Jason has been targeted by Richie many times on social media, and it really does speak to how out of touch or how, how deliberately, and I don't want to say out of touch because I think this is a deliberate choice on the part of the uh, Torah's office, um, to choose to target a progressive queer Jew in New York City is a, a publicly facing choice on behalf of like who his base is, which are the right wing, which are the center leaning and right wing Zionists. And so for him to go after somebody like Jason, it really speaks to how much he has chosen the side of the culture war, which is is also very much embedded in uh, the Jewish community right now. And I think Jason and I are both representative of a, a, a not, I don't want to say a generational shift, but a very large cultural shift in the Jewish world right now, where many of us who are anti-Zionist um, have actually chosen to not only uh, step out of or step away from, but, but turn around and reject the institutions that we've come from. So the action that we took this past week was really um, a, a, a direct one for people. I, you know, I think Jason mentioned earlier that he worked for the 92nd Street Y and I'm a rabbi's child and I was raised in Jewish institutions as well and raised very Zionist and I also have Israeli citizenship. So to, to go into these institutions as somebody who comes from them and then to turn around and say, I reject you, I call you out from your inside. Um, to me feels like a, a very significant part of the work because um, for many years, many of us uh, in the anti-Zionist Jewish movement just simply left, simply walked hmm. away. And they were able to say, um, oh, those are fringe Jews. This is what uh, both yeah. Richie Torres and Michael Lawler and the 92nd Street Y have said and AJC have said they refer to us as fringe. They refer to us as outsiders. Um, Richie Torres used the word astroturf anti-Israeli, which I have That's never right. heard before, which was very funny. Oh, about us, right? How, none about, of us are I mean, not about you guys on Thursday, right? Yeah, yeah. like R Richie here is the constituent of Richie Torres. I was raised between Queens and Westchester. Uh, Jason is a New Yorker. We are all real New York constituents. We are all real New York anti-Zionists. And so to claim that um, we are somehow astroturf like, please, who's paying us? Like, show, show me. I, I wish. Show, yeah. I wish. Show me the funds. Like, we are, this was an incredible, incredible example of what organic grassroots organizing was, looks like. So this was people who were motivated by something, had an idea, took it and ran with it. And I, I really, I genuinely hope that people see this as a model for how things can be successfully done because it, it, it wasn't difficult. It just took some time, some motivation, and some focus. And I think that we uh, did a really successful job at shutting down their event. Um, and, and like I was saying earlier, I, I think it's it's vital for us to not only be outside of the room um, protesting against them, but shutting them down from the inside and taking a stance. And um, one of the things I also know is that even within the Jewish institutions, there are many, many people who are questioning or or even anti-Zionist and really wondering why their organizations are behaving the way they're behaving. So another thing that we were hoping to do was to highlight the fact that we're, we're in the building. We're in the building and the walls are going to come down and there, there's nowhere anywhere that Zionists can meet without having to hear from us that they have blood on their hands. And mm. I felt like we really took it to them. Yeah. And just wanted to show uh, the visuals of what Jason was talking to talking about. Here's his tweet. So Jason writes, this is a pretty this is pretty stunning to watch play out. Richie Torres gets an emphatic endorsement on his of his attack uh, of me from Christine Pusha. 
press secretary of Ron DeSantis of Don't Say Gay Bill and someone who herself pushed Rothschild anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. So Jason had said originally, I have to say I'm thoroughly tired of Richie Torres speaking on behalf of Jews. There are Jewish New Yorkers that believe that Israel is an apartheid state, that BDS is not anti-Semitic and do not need a non-Jewish member of Congress smearing people in their name. And then Richie writes, I do not pretend to speak for anyone but myself and express any opinion but my own. It's a free country and I have a right to express whatever opinion I wish on whatever topic I wish. And if you have an issue with that, that's your damn problem. Uh, and then uh, Christine Pushaw writes, I wish all Democrat politicians were more like you. It's incredibly dangerous um, to have these uh, so-called, I mean, I want to call Richie Torres the astroturf progressive. It's incredibly dangerous to have them targeting real progressives, real Jews, um, you know, queer New Yorkers so publicly as, as a method of attracting their base, their base who are violent, their base who are 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 motivated to do harm. I mean, we saw in the video the other night how how angry these people are yeah. so to, you know they're yelling about doxing us and and i don't think those people really know what doxing is but oh yeah um, but they were saying we're gonna dox the shit they, out of you we're they, gonna dox they are motivated you, by violence and, and i think any of us who have been targeted publicly by them it, it's very scary to have this this mob they're a mob yeah. come after you and, and i know jason has been targeted by it i know many of us have been on the receiving end of it and 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 just the way that richie repeatedly targets jason specifically it turns into something that feels very sinister um and becomes a question of why what's the political goal of repeatedly yeah. targeting a new york queer jewish activist yeah, he he screenshot some of my tweets without tagging me and said I was like, you know, exhibit A of anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, I was shocked by the response of the audience because I was there. Let's actually show a video, a short video. I think it's like a minute, a little mashup of what I, I captured. Very crappy footage, but it's just interesting audio. Uh, this is the, the do you have the uh, the YouTube video? Oh, yeah. If not, we can screen share. It's that short YouTube short. You, how you're thinking about the Abraham Accords right now? Because clearly you've both been involved in trying to promote it and for October 7th. And now we are in a moment when we have- Father Suarez, you can't- <laughs> They were really aggressive, the security. There's Roz Pacheski, who's been on the show, who's 81, older than the state of Israel, as she likes to say. She looked like this old Jewish lady. And there you see. So were you surprised by the vitriol from the audience? It, I, you know, it was very aggressive. I, I expected a response, but the, the level, the immediacy was actually shocking. Um, I saw I saw a tweet recently that said something like, I, I expected this level of violence, you know, I expected this level of violence and vitriol and hatred, but I still find it shocking. Yeah. about everything going on in the world. And I think that that's really uh, how I felt the other night. Um, you know, you were there, we were all there. And it, it was this room of a bunch of people who came out on a Thursday night for to sit and have a, a good time listening to their congressman. And they're all congenial, you know, nice people, you know, I, I want to say nice Germans. Um, and uh and they turned so fast the minute foxy started speaking the minute richie's group got up the minute i started the minute the next disruption started and just how immediate and how ready they were to um to tussle to be combative yeah. was was really probably the most um 
shocking. And I, I, I mentioned that I come from Jewish institutions. So in some levels, I was prepared for what kind of what the racism might look like. But like, I think having brought in people who come from outside our community, I really had an opportunity to kind of reflect in the immediate moment how shocking it was people were referring to it like feeling like they were at a clan rally and i i absolutely felt that as well mm. i'm i'm not surprised because we've held protest outside of richie torres's office as i mentioned before and when we've uh when he's tweeted about the protests on his social media page I'll see the comments that are written by his Zionist fan base, I guess. And they're usually always saying like, you know, next time call in the National Guard to, to stomp them out. Why isn't the cops there to beat them up? Like they'll literally say these things like on social media. So, you know, I, you know, Zionism is fascism. And it was very evident by this, uh, by the crowd's reaction that, they wanted nothing more than to, you know, throw us to those uh, uh, very rough security guards that actually, um, you know, violently attacked uh, several of the folks that were part of this disruption. Yeah, I was surprised that right away they were so physical with the protesters. I thought they would, like, approach them and, like, walk them out. Um, but uh, they were very physical. And then there's this one moment where... Um, the people are chanting, get her out, get her out. And a, a woman actually, a younger woman grabbed this older woman, like by the sweater, by her, by her sh sleeve and pulled her off the chair, uh, which I was surprised, kind of surprised about. Uh, it's just funny because these people try to play so proper Upper East Side. And it was really funny because that woman, I was sitting next to Roz Pacheski, who's, as I said, she's 81 years old and she likes to point out that she's older than the state of Israel. And after she left, I, I stayed behind because I wanted to get audio of the rest of it. And after she left, this woman next to us is like, oh, my God, one of them was sitting next to me. And she was I thought she was a Jew, nice Jewish old lady like me. Um, I want that on a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I also want to add, you know, it's it's a really, you know, interesting vantage point um, protesting an event at your former employer. So you have an idea of what, you know clients or like attendees would be there um but you know i was also like before i was mentioning to our you know really great grassroots uh, coalition of disruptors um that are that the the y security guard are ex-cops so i was like you know bring your full self you know make sure that we watch out for each other because this is really no joke and it was interesting to like not only like, you know, be there, you know, protesting an event at your former institution, but also being assaulted by your former colleagues. It's a very, you know, visceral experience, especially for those who have experienced police brutality or, you know, have um, different relationships with cops. Is that, and that's what I wanted to ensure that we, you know, especially all got out safe and that everyone was taken care of both before and after the event. Um, but it, it was a very strong thing that a lot of a lot of us experienced. Um, a colleague had you overlapped Mark, with yeah. them. Sorry, had you overlapped with any of the security guards? Yeah, yes, some of them were new. Like the one who uh, manhandled me was new, and so I didn't know who he was. Um, but it, but yeah, it's like one of those things, like that you that you both expect but don't expect because yeah. I expected. The vitriol in the room. I didn't expect it to get that unruly. I expected the security guards to be rough, but I didn't expect them to be that rough. So it was a very, you know, reality check, mask off um, thing that happened that Thursday evening. Yeah. I think the well, descent into yeah. chaos that you show, yeah. um, it really shows how poorly they handled the room and handled our disruptions. Um, so, I mean, that really drives home what we did was effective, even though we had, you know, we did end up receiving such a, a violent pushback from the crowd and from the security. But because they were so ready to disrupt their own event by 
hunting for disruptors in the crowd, looking for, um, you know, and starting fights, um, it, it really speaks to why this kind of thing is effective as a model. Hmm. And I wanted to ask as uh, two last questions for me, Can what is the relationship between Richie and Israel or Richie and APAC? And then how did each of you become anti-Zionists? I'll let Richie take that um, that question, the first one. Yeah, I'm just so Googling. <laughs> the, yeah, if somebody wants to get the exact number, I think it's close to maybe $500,000 that uh, Richie Torres has taken from APAC this year. And um, it's what, like I said before, he was, he was handpicked because he checks a lot of like identity boxes and he was willing to um, to, to sell it to the highest bidder. Um, in terms of how I became an anti-Zionist, well, I traveled throughout the Middle East or West Asia, which is, I like to refer it as, um, on my own a couple of years ago. And I actually went to both Israel and the West Bank. And I want to say that as I traveled throughout the region, I was by myself as a as a gay person and I felt very safe the entire time. I just want to put it out there. Um, I went to the West Bank as a very unconscious person. I just was like, hey, I don't know what this is all about. What's Palestine all about? Like, you know, I've heard not nice things, but I've had good, good experiences so far in the region. Let's go check it out. And while I was um, making my way through the, the security crossing, I happened to stand next to another American who was a graduate student uh, studying like Middle Eastern studies or something like that. And he, and he spoke Arabic. I didn't. He said, Hey, when we, when we get to uh, Ramallah, do you want to uh, share a cab with me? Like we could hire a cab driver and he'll just drive us around to different parts of the West bank. And I said, yeah, great, let's do it. So uh, while we were driving with this, with this Palestinian cab driver, um, he was just explaining everything to us. And he was like, oh, you see this hill with these beautiful new houses? That's an Israeli settlement. Um, that's actually where I grew up, but they bulldozed all of our homes and, and they put this, this new settlement and, and we're not allowed there. And, you know, so I was like, wait, what? Like, I honestly didn't know this at all because we're not told this in, in, in the news or in school. Um, and, I, you know, I remember driving on different roads and then the, the cab driver said like, oh yeah, you see this zone, like well, I'm not allowed here, but we're allowed here. I remember the checkpoints as well. There was IDF soldiers who would, you know, stop the car and said, hey, I need everybody to show me your IDs. Um, and it was just very militarized and very just, you know, it felt, it, it felt like you were in jail being in Palestine. And it was really going there myself that I was like, wow, like everything I've been, I've, I've learned about Palestine was a lie. And I need to go back to the U S and, and tell people the truth about what I saw. So that was my personal journey. And, and if folks, you know, have a chance to, to, to go, I, I, I recommend, um, you know, doing that and seeing it for, for yourself. Thanks. It's funny, hey, Torres, Torres said the same thing, right, about why he is a Zionist, as he said something like, uh, I'm a Zionist because I've been there and I've seen it myself, but the question I wanted to ask him is, well, have you been to Palestine? Have you been to Ramallah? Have you been to Gaza? Have you actually seen it with your own two eyes? And, you know, I think, you know, to hear Richie speak to that is really important. Um, my own background is that, as I've mentioned earlier, I'm a citizen, Israeli and American, and most of my family does live in Israel. My um, father's parents migrated from Kurdish Iraq in 1936 to Palestine and um, joined the, the Jewish agency and joined the Jewish state building effort. Um, 
And my grandfather participated in the, in the war in 48 and committed the Nakba. And I was raised as a fairly nominal um, American Zionist with this extra asterisk of I'm also Israeli. So my Zionist upbringing was fairly complete. Um, and I guess I like to say that I became anti-Zionist because I started learning from Palestinians. Um, and it's it's been many, many years of my life now. Um, most of my life has been a journey out of Zionism into uh, proud anti-Zionism. Um, and I work with journalists in the Gaza Strip now uh, with an organization called the 16th October Media Group with a journalist named Wafa al Udaini, who 80 days into genocide is still reporting, is still on the ground taking pictures. Um, and uh, I, I, for me, um, as somebody who has Israeli citizenship, as somebody who was raised in these communities, um, uh, my anti-Zionism is really uh, as much about uh, uh, fighting back against uh, the Israeli assault on Palestinian livelihood as it is about what, what it has done to my community. And to watch the people that I've grown up with um, people that I've loved deeply go down a genocidal, you know, spiral has always been something that radicalizes me just as much as witnessing the the violence. Um, I think both sides. I, I watch. I watch parents mourn over their children. I watch children mourn over their parents, and it breaks my heart and then I watch people gleefully cheer for it and it breaks my heart and enrages me and it pushes me to want to disrupt and want to shut down and want to put an end to these things and I don't want to say because it's in my name I, I happen to have all of these intersecting identities that are right there but I don't think that one must be Jewish or must be Palestinian or must be Muslim or must be uh, have any kind of affiliation with the region what at all to care about Palestine because apartheid is a human issue um, and so I while I'm always happy to speak you know uh, I, I i that's what i really hate about what richie torres does the way he weaponizes his identities because i could easily weaponize my identities and I feel often compelled to be like but i'm also an israeli and i oppose uh the apartheid but it, it, it's not an identity issue at all and and i think that even this dialectic of appealing to identity is another way of distracting from the fact we are 80 days into genocide we have no idea how many people have actually been killed because it's impossible to count and we have no idea what the future is going to look like for millions of people and so it, like these are the things that would make anybody reasonably right. an anti-Zionist, regardless of your identities. And it's like, if at this point in 80 days in, you're not like, what the hell is going on? I, I am speechless at that. That shocks me. And I can't imagine that this has anything to do with me being Israeli or anti-Zionist. Right. I think this has to do with me being a human with a certain set of morals. I totally hear that. And I also feel sometimes conflicted about saying as a Jew, this as a Jew that, but I also know that we live in the, a world that exists. Yeah. And if we don't do that, then the only people saying as a Jew are the ones who Absolutely. are defending Absolutely. genocide. Absolutely. And that becomes dangerous. First of all, it's wrong. And it shows the world a warped vision of what it means to be Jewish. But I'll also talk about like anti-Semitism. I mean, it's so anti-Semitic. And yeah. I also want to speak to, actually, I just want to uh, speak about an essay that was written by the murdered Dr. Rafat al who published a series of essays. This is an essay called um, There is no, uh, no Poetry of Mass Destruction. And he discusses um, how he grew up until he was 36 years old. He didn't know any right. Jews who didn't want to kill him. And by the end of the essay, he discusses coming to America and actually living with Jews, members of Jewish Voice for Peace. And the way the essay ends is he says, I don't know what the future for Palestine is, but I leave it in the hands of my Jewish friends. And so Dr. Alarir believed that 
we did have a role to play yeah. and i believe that we do and i mean i've been sitting here yelling from the, the fringe or whatever for however long i've been here and i have seen people move and move and move and so i believe that um maybe sometimes people do need to hear it from various different voices but we're always centering palestinian voices we're always learning from palestinians first and leading in that way uh we're letting palestinians lead in that way and i so I, you know i think that we just have to maintain the balance and so i will say like i'm jewish but at the same time i'm taking my lead from Dr. Alarir, who is a friend of mine and whose murder I lament and will yeah. rage against my whole life. Right. Yeah, we had him on my my other show, and um, oh, yeah, tragic and infuriating. And we had a, I did a special with some of his former students too. Um, yeah, really infuriating. Um, and Jason. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just give a, a, a quick overview, but I think a lot of my, um, I guess, um, realization and sometimes radicalization of my politics um, almost always came from elders. So when I first walked into an ACT UP room, I, I knew I was in the right place and eventually, you know, found who I was supposed to be and who I was supposed to be with. Um, and Can you, I, just you explain know, for people what ACT UP is in case they don't know? Yeah, so um, ACT UP is the um, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power um, and was formed in March 1987 to fight the AIDS crisis with direct action. And I think a lot of our models, um, you know, even with uh, a lot of work that JVP is doing is, is replicating in that way as well about some of the action, even act down to the actions that they did, um, such as the Grand Central Action, which was replicated from the uh, Day of Desperation. Um, but, you know, I think a lot like Alana, um, you know, I'm a suburban Jew from Long Island uh, that was indoctrinated with a lot of uh, Zionism and dehumanization of Palestinians. Um, we would go to the Israeli Day Parade and they would shield kids from seeing counter protesters. And, you know, that's what dehumanization does and continues to do. And I, I think in college where I, I met my first Palestinian friend and was like, you know, how come you know, why is this happening, basically? And asking those questions that I wish I asked earlier. Um, and and I think to continue on to that point, um, it wasn't until maybe uh, until I met Shotzi Weisberger, the late great Shotzi, um, where I could fully with conviction say I'm an anti-Zionist Jew because she did it so eloquently and she did it with such compassion. Um, and she was a member and of Jewish Voice for Peace, for people who don't know. She was, and she was also on the front lines of, you know, the women's rights movement and, um, you know, the LGBT movement and during the AIDS crisis. So I think that if anyone could speak on, on and along the intersections of, you know, identity and our struggles, our collective struggles with people, it's her. So I, you know, whenever I'm in the streets and whenever I think about, who I want to emblem. I think about Chatsi and I think about our, you know, our ancestors that um, build our movement and continue to build our movement. And so that's why it was like such an honor to have, for instance, Ross, Wissa, Ross uh, Pacheski with us because, you know, we had a lot of youth representing us and then we had our elders. So it was just such a multi-generational effort to speak truth to power, especially when we have such bad faith people in decision-making power. So um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's my my journey of becoming an anti-Zionist. And Alana, one final question for you. Did you, you said it was through meeting Palestinians. Was there an aha moment? Like, was this in college? Was this in high school? Where did you meet the Palestinians who, who changed your view on this? Yeah. I mean, the... Uh... <laughs> the very funny story is that when I was on birthright, um, I was uh, on this. Um, and that's a free program for people who don't know. A free program is a free, for, is a free for trip. Who um, been 
to Israel. Although I guess you can have gone, they'll let you, they'll pay for you if you've only gone with your family, right? Yeah. yeah. So Birthright is a free trip um, for Jewish young people sponsored by the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs and various different donor groups uh, for, uh, internationally. Um, and it's targeted at college students, it's targeted at young adults. And I, I, having been an Israeli citizen, thought I wasn't able to go, but I did go. And it was actually the only time in my life I ever went on an actual like tour of the country. Prior to that, I had only ever been with my family. So it was really not uh, a, a tourist place for me. It was where my family lived. So I wasn't exposed maybe in some of the ways to some of the uh, touristic narrative that many people were. and. I went and I I kind of thought it was a ridiculous trip, but um, they took us on a, and I mean, Jason also said his first, the first Palestinian he met was in college. It should really, uh, like really cement how much the Jewish community is shielded and intentionally segregated from Palestinians. Um, I'm on birthright in Israel, Palestine, on the Jordan River, uh, on a white on a white river rafting trip, and a raft next to us of Palestinian students um, paddles up, and they start talking to us, and um, we just speaking. You know, they ask where we're from. We say America, New York. They're like, "Welcome. How long are you here?" You know, and we're having a nice time. And we go around the bend and uh, there are a dozen Israeli boys who are dive bombing all the rafts and they jump on all these rafts and, you know, they're having a good time, but they're a little aggressive. Um, and so the next thing I know, I find myself with these like six Palestinian girls who are all in hijab and we're all wearing bikinis and we're like fighting these Israeli boys. And, you know, it's, it, it, on the surface, it's just this like young people having a nice time in the summer. And then uh, there's so many levels of like politics, and intersectional like identity levels there, like Palestinian girls, American girls, Israeli boys in the Jordan River. Um, and I thought about that moment a lot because I, I was just like after that, I was like, you know, they, they tell you on birthright, you're going to meet Israelis. And I was like, wow, I met Palestinians. This is cool. And this speaks to how racist it is in the communities. Like, they didn't hate me, which I've heard so many other, like, young Jews articulate when they, like, finally, like, oh, they didn't hate me because we're taught from a young age that the basis of Palestinian existence is hatred of Jews, which is... You know, it's one of those things where every accusation is a confession right. because actually what is taught is hatred of Palestinians. And we see this now coming home to roost when the Jewish community is um, claiming that there's rising anti-Semitism everywhere. But what there's really rising is Palestinian solidarity. And the only way that you can see rising Palestinian solidarity as rising anti-Semitism is if you inherently believe that Palestine is anti-Semitism. And I believe that's what we're witnessing. And I think that, you know, the way I was raised and the way many of us were raised with this very deeply indoctrinated racism is very, very violent, murderous, genocidal, genocidal racism um, that uh, is, is fully in view now that Israel is committing genocide. Well, thank you, guys. This was such a great discussion. Really want to thank you for all your work and for joining. Thank you so much Thank for having you. us. Katie. Thanks so much, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Bye. Take care. You too. And we've we've only just begun. That was uh, fabulous, and I uh, really enjoyed that talk. Uh, I'm so excited to keep the show going because we have our next guest, who um, is usually based in Bethlehem. She's uh, in the states now, which means that she can talk to us um, because late night on the East Coast is not a convenient time when you're in Palestine. So we're going to bring on to the show Yum Yumna Patel, who is the Palestine News Director for Manda Weiss. Hi, Yumna. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
So tell us the latest uh, news coming from Bethlehem, from the West Bank, Gaza. Um, what what, is, what are the, the big stories that people need to know about? Yeah, sure. Um, I hate to say it, but I think it's a lot of the same of what we've been seeing just escalated. So, I mean, over the course of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we saw dozens of Palestinians rounded up during Israeli raids across the West Bank, including in Bethlehem. So you had the Israeli military raiding the birthplace of Jesus and arresting Palestinians from that place on Christmas, um, which, um, you know, the irony is not lost there, especially since Christmas festivities in the city were canceled out of solidarity with Gaza and essentially in mourning from the the Palestinian community there. So raids are ongoing in the occupied West Bank. The raids are becoming more and more violent. Um, It's very clear that Israel's shoot to kill policy, which has existed for decades, is being escalated to a degree that many haven't seen in decades, perhaps since the Second Intifada, um, Israeli forces are staging mass destructive raids on refugee camps, um, cities and towns in the occupied West Bank. They're shooting people dead. Over the past few weeks, we've seen videos come out of Palestinians essentially being um, extrajudicial judicially executed in the West Bank during Israeli military raids. And of course, that also carries over into Gaza on a much more massive scale. The the big stories that we've been seeing unfold just over the past few days alone have been of essentially these detention and torture camps where dozens, hundreds of Gazan men and boys are essentially being taken, kidnapped, stripped of their clothing, and kept in these detention camps when they do make it back. Um, it, for those who are lucky enough to make it back, for those who do make it back, they report very harrowing stories of torture, um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, verbal abuse, physical assault, um, starvation, deprivation of of water as well. Um, so, so really, really horrible things are happening in Gaza in addition to the massive bombings that are nonstop. Um, just yesterday, I believe, Israel carried out what many people are describing as a massacre and the Al-Maghazi refugee camp, which is in the central Gaza Strip. So we're 81 days, I believe, into this genocide, and every single day it becomes more and more apparent. apparent. Um, from the footage that we are seeing Israeli soldiers film of themselves, that Israel is carrying out a genocide um, and the horrific images that we're seeing in Gaza are, you know, could be straight out of a history textbook of genocides that have been carried out in the past. So let's take a look at some of these images. Let's see, we have this image um, uh, of uh, young men and boys. Uh, So for, it's a, the tweet is from Hanin Hassan says, zoom in, because no, you're not confused. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's a, and that is a quote tweet of a tweet by Rami Abdul saying, field executions, mass detentions, alarming footage of Israeli forces turning a stadium in Gaza into a mass detention camp. The mm-hmm. video shows the detention of hundreds of civilians, including women, elders, and babies. And here's that footage. And you see the, these men in the field, uh, the, the stadium. Um, let's see, can we hear the audio? Is what is the audio on that? I guess there's no audio. So I think the audio on that was turned down, but from other videos I've seen, apparently, um, this video compilation that we're seeing now was first published, um, allegedly by an Israeli journalist or reporter that's embedded with the Israeli military. And it had some sort of music overlaid with it essentially a montage um, meant to show the military activities, which is what was described by the Israeli military when it responded to um, reports of these videos and condemnations of this particular video. Um, The Israeli military 
called it basically routine military exercises and said it was well within the parameters of international law. But as that screenshot from Hanin's tweet showed us, they're among the men, um, old and young, including disabled. There are also boys stripped down to their underwear with their hands up um, underneath, you know, under the guns and, and tanks of Israeli of Israeli military. And right there at the end, um, you see an Israeli soldier holding a bundle of a blanket that alleges that allegedly is a Palestinian baby in Gaza. And there's not too much information on who that baby is, where they came from, what the circumstances were. Um, but this video has really been making the rounds on social media over the past two days. Al Jazeera did a report about it as well um, because it's not the first image that we've seen like this, as you know, over the past few weeks, so many images exactly like that one of rows and rows of men and boys lined up, stripped down to their underwear, their hands up, um, being surrounded by Israeli soldiers um, in various detention camps, essentially being created by the Israeli military inside and outside of Gaza. So this is just the latest um, such, you know, camp that's that's been established. And a lot of people have pointed out that it's reminiscent of what Pinochet did with the stadium um, in, in Chile. So mm -hmm. um, where, uh, for instance, um, Victor Hara was killed. Um, let's see. I think we have another thing to show. Um, so, so this is a video published by Al Jazeera um, where Palestinian prisoners are speaking of the torture basically in Israeli detention centers. So if you um, go back, you can see at the very beginning of the video, they're showing their wrists and we've seen lots of images of this. And basically um, whatever the Israeli soldiers tied okay, these it. men's hands with has essentially dug so far into their skin um, that it's caused these terrible scars. We've also seen images of um, some men's hands like completely swollen basically after the circulation was cut off to their hands because of how tightly they were bound. Um, and you can continue to play the video. You'll also see men showing on their bodies um, places where Israeli soldiers put out um, lit cigarettes onto their bodies, creating different scars. Um, this man, it, uh, some of these men talk about how they were just constantly hit and hit and hit. They were beaten. Um, if you didn't do exactly what the Israeli soldier said, one man said that the Israeli soldiers ordered them to bark and if they like dogs, and if they didn't bark like dogs and they were beaten, um, if you were beaten and then you said, you know, I'm sick, I can't take it. They would beat you more. Um, these prisoners were deprived of food and water. Um, and this man here is saying that, you know, they were given dirty water to drink some hallucinogenic substances that caused them hallucinations. Um, they were also like treated with, uh, tortured with electric shocks, um, and were st basically starved mm -hmm. of food and water. It's, it's really horrible stuff. Um, this is just one video of many, many videos that we've seen, um, that outlets like Al Jazeera have covered and that human rights groups like uh, Euromed Monitor have actually released reports to, um, that reports about, sorry, basically saying that um, there are horrific conditions being faced by Palestinian deta detainees, essentially in what they call torture camps and detention camps. And they've also reported that... Um, Palestinian prisoners in Gaza who are being taken captive, uh, Palestinian civ civilians who are being taken captive have been summarily executed as well um, in the process of being taken to these, these torture camps. You have this man, this elderly man here in this interview with Al Jazeera, he says that he was held for about 30 days. Um, and in the first, I believe, week to two weeks or week to 10 days, he was only given water. He was not given any food. And then he was fed one cucumber a day or one apple a day and it was essentially um the soldiers alternated between feeding him a cucumber or an apple 
um, this man that comes on screen now, he talks about how he was beaten and how Israeli, um, you know, soldiers said, oh, where do you want us to, to hit you or where do you want us how do you want to be killed? And he said, okay, I'll be a martyr. They said, you know, we're not going to martyr you. They just tortured him and they made him wear diapers uh, because they wouldn't let him go to the bathroom. So he had to soil himself. Um, and so again, these are like one, two, three, four testimonies of hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, and it's, it's really, really harrowing stuff. And this is happening constantly. So in Gaza, not only are Gazans being bombed um, constantly, but civilians, mostly men um, and boys are being taken. They're being taken from shelters where from different schools where people are sheltering. They're being taken from their homes um, and they're being sent off to these detention camps and torture camps um, where they're being severely abused and some of them have even been executed. Awful. And you you hear people, you know, you'll see on social media something like this will be tweeted out and they'll say, well, they were Hamas. Mm -hmm. Or what do you want? To, what can we do? They all want to kill, unfortunately, October 7th. Mm -hmm. Like there's just there, there's nothing Israel can do that will, for a lot of people, there's literally nothing Israel can do that will make them say, okay, this is problematic. Right. And it's, it's really scary because how long can you go on, you know, claiming just cl claiming October 7th as a justification for what's happening? We've sur far surpassed the death toll of, right. um, 20,000, according to some rights groups, um, thousands and thousands of children have been killed. And like you see here, we are seeing people being detained en masse and tortured. And in that first screenshot that we saw, those are boys in their underwear being held up at gunpoint and being held up by tanks. So what crime have they committed, you know, to be um, to be treated like this? And so, you know, we're 81 days into this so many human rights experts, genocide experts and researchers have said this is a genocide. Mm -hmm. It's a textbook genocide from the aerial bombardment to the torture camps, to the executions, to the starvation, the deprivation of food and water, um, to the calls, open calls by, from the Israeli prime minister and Israeli officials to carry out an ethnic cleansing and send Gazans into the Sinai. Um, and yet every response or a lot of the times the response that we get is, you know, well, October 7th. So, right. October 7th, or there's this other kind of shocking response, I think, which is like, it's not genocide because if they wanted to, they could kill all of them like in, in one <laughs> bomb. Like, I've really heard people say that, like anything yeah. short of the total annihilation right. of Palestinians is like almost generous. Right. Exactly. It's like, well, we could drop a nuclear weapon on Gaza right. if we wanted to, but we're not. So somehow that um, means that we're being humane. Right. Let's see. We have some more um, footage, um, tweets that you shared. Um, do you want to watch this one? Do you want to? Uh... So this is a screenshot also from that same video, but it's basically just to put into perspective, like the scale. And I think images like this are just very shocking. Um, you know, we've seen tweets from people say these are essentially a lot of these images are, are identical to the way that um, Bosnian men and boys were were rounded up and before they were executed during the the genocide in Bosnia. Um, and so I think images like these are really important to see because those zoomed away when you do zoom in and some of the other, you know, shots that we saw, there are elderly men there. Um, disabled men, boys, and dozens and dozens of civilians who have just been stripped, um, not only of their clothing, but of every basic human right and and dignity. Um, and Israel is essentially saying that it's, it's well within their rights to do this because they're suspected of terrorism. You also have a tweet um, about um, Farouk Khatib from Ramallah. Mm -hmm. um let's go to that one um that is the tweet by kuds um i t andrew i just texted it to you mm -hmm. 
Um, did I just text it to you? It's the last one in the email. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, and this is from Kluge's News Network. Mm -hmm. um, breaking Farouk Khatib from Ramallah, West Bank, has been released from an Israeli jail. The photos show him before and after being kidnapped by Israeli forces. Farouk was kidnapped three months ago and detained under administrative detention without charge of trial. So here he is on the left, looking before. almost unrecognizable before being um, detained. And mm -hmm. here he is on the right, looking absolutely gaunt, emaciated. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I remember actually like the last time you were on, um, you know, you were talking about uh, precisely about administrative detention. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about this person? Yeah. So a little more information about Farouk. So a lot of people may have seen this image. As you can see, it got around eight and he, more he than he eight. Look like he's views. in Auschwitz. Like people have pointed that out that he looks like it's very reminiscent of exactly so this image was really shocking to people because like you said a lot of people were saying that this you know him on the right looks like he could have been plucked from a photo of any detention or internment camp um during the holocaust because of how emaciated and, and gaunt he looks and sort of the look in his his eyes um so people were really shocked when Quds news network posted this photo because we have heard um testimonies over the past two months of prisoners in the West Bank detailing horrible, horrible conditions inside Israeli prisons um, for the ones who are released. And as you and I discussed the last time I was on, that a lot of the prisoners um, of the thousands who have been rounded up since October 7th, um, a lot of them are just being thrown arbitrarily in administrative detention. So in Farouk's case, actually, and I, we actually interviewed his brother, and so we got some more details about his case. And in Farouk's case, actually, he was detained, his brother said, around a month before uh, October 7th happened. Um, and he was thrown in administrative detention. So again, that just shows that administrative detention isn't a new policy. It didn't just, Israel didn't just start using it after October 7th. It's been using it for decades. Basically, he was thrown in jail um, in September, about a month before October 7th. As far as his family knew, he was fine. He was in good health. He didn't really have any major health issues that they were aware of. When October 7th happened, Farouk's family, like all the families of Palestinian prisoners, lost communication completely with them. So basically what happened after October 7th was Israel essentially cut off Palestinian political prisoners who at that time numbered several thousand and have essentially doubled since October 7th. They cut the prisoners off from communication. So they ended family visits, lawyers' visits. The International Red Cross has been prevented from visiting the prisons. Um, only when some prisoners re were released, either in the, the prisoner exchange deal that happened in November or, you know, prisoners who have been lucky enough not to get administrative detention um, orders, it's been revealed slowly that prisoners have been facing starvation, the deprivation of water, um, arbitrary solitary confinement, frequent prison raids, beatings, um, torture, and, you know, everything that we we talked about that prisoners in Gaza have been facing as well. Um, and so, Farouk's family lost contact with him. It was only, you know, a couple after two months, basically. So earlier in December, essentially, um, that his family was visited by a prisoner who happened to be Farouk's cellmate um, and had been released from jail. And he made it a point to go visit Farouk's family and said, hey, do you know what's happening with your brother? Like he is on his deathbed and this family had no idea because all communications have been cut off with prisoners. They thought he was okay. They didn't know anything about his condition. They started frantically calling around to different rights groups um, and, and lawyers and the Palestinian authority to try and, and, you know, get an understanding of what, what was, what was wrong with him. Um, then just last week, they basically caught a call saying um, 
Farouk is being dropped off at an Israeli military checkpoint outside of Ramallah. Come pick him up. And this was still only, you know, he still had two months left in his administrative detention order. So the family knew something's wrong because Israel doesn't just release prisoners like that, you know. Um, and then that's when they saw him in this state, completely emaciated, basically skin and bones, a ghost of who he was before he went into prison. Um, he was taken to the hospital in Ramallah for extensive checkups where basically he described to his family that um, after October 7th, he was, he like many other prisoners were transferred between prisons and they were severely, severely beaten. And after that, he experienced a number of, of medical conditions, uh, you know, um, illnesses and just kept feeling really sick. His situation continued to deteriorate. He basically lost half of his body weight. And every time he asked to be um, treated or go to the hospital he, by uh, Israeli prison authorities would throw him into solitary confinement. Um, eventually, as he got worse and worse, um, as I understood, Israeli um the Israeli prison authorities conducted some some medical tests on him, um, and it was determined that he had cancer that had spread through certain parts of his body. And again, the family, he was perfectly healthy. They don't know when this cancer may have arrived, if it, you know, it had he had been living with it and then it, you know, became worse while he was prison, while he was in prison. But they knew that, you know, he was deteriorating for several weeks. Israeli authorities were doing nothing um, until he essentially lost half his body weight and looked like he was going to die. And then they just released him back to his family where the Palestinian doctor said um, it's essentially too late if they had been able to treat him. Um, for whatever illnesses he may have and for whatever this cancer is causing, um, these issues that the cancer is causing, he maybe, you know, would have had a better prognosis. But essentially, because of the mistreatment, the medical neglect, the torture and the abuse he faced in Israeli prison, it's essentially too late. And they basically are just giving him palliative care um, and waiting for him to die. And the family says, the family, of course, are completely distraught and they're saying, you know, how many more prisoners are there like Farouk that are just wasting away in Israeli prisons? Are they sick? Are they being tortured to death? Um, and their families don't know anything about what is happen what's happening to them, what state they may be in. Um, and Farouk's brother also pointed out, you know, that at least six Palestinian prisoners have died in Israeli custody since October 7th. Um, and their families, those bodies have still not been returned to their families. Um, and prisoners' rights groups pretty much don't know what happened to them because Israel um, is refusing to, to release them. And so this one case specifically is very much, um, I think it gives us an, a window into the the sort of treatment and abuse and medical neglect that Palestinian prisoners are facing because you know you either may be physically assaulted or tortured or starved into becoming sick or you might have a pre-existing medical condition that you know about or you don't know about but because you're in Israeli prison um you're not getting the treatment that you need and so that could then end up costing you your life and how old is he he's 30 and he was just married before he went to jail. And again, he was in administrative detention, so there were no charges against him. He was never charged. He was never tried in court. So he essentially was in Israeli prison for four months, um, extremely ill, extremely sick, being abused and thrown in solitary confinement, denied medical treatment. And he actually never was charged with a crime. And you spoke to his brother, you said? Mm-hmm. What yeah. kind of state is the brother in? I mean, his. I think, you know, his brother said that their family is still in shock. They right. were essentially, they were extremely shocked when they saw him. They didn't recognize him because it was essentially this like skeleton walking towards them when they realized that 
oh my God, you know, when he realized that's my brother. Um, and so the family are trying to, somehow to come to terms with this prognosis that he doesn't have that many days in front of them. But his, you know, his brother said that he's really hoping that the images of Farouk and what happened to him, they were very shocking. They saw how much those images were being circulated on social media. And he said their only hope is that those images stir something inside people to care about Palestinian prisoners, which he described as prisoners of war and political prisoners, and saying, you know, not to forget them and to really pay attention to what's happening to them, to demand answers and to demand an end to, to their torture and abuse, just in the hopes that there isn't another person that suffers the same fate as his brother. And what is the prognosis? Is essentially that the doctor said he's essentially far beyond any real help. And so the family should just enjoy their last days with him. That's so awful. And it's, it's how it's, 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 it's I think impossible for any of us to really imagine how horrible that is. Anyone who's had like a sick family member um, knows how helpless you feel when you can't do anything to help that person. Um, but add to that, like the knowing that they could, ha they actually could have been saved or they may have been saved um, if they weren't rotting in a prison that they should never have been in in the first place without having been charged yeah that's so awful wow well any anything else you want to um make sure that you mention or that people know about because you're you do such great work and so i always love having you on to give people kind of an update about just some of the stories that are happening thanks i think you know, the, this issue of the torture and abuse of prisoners, both in the West Bank and Gaza and all across occupied Palestine. We published an article recently in Mondawais about how administrative detention is also being used as a tactic against Palestinians who carry Israeli citizenship. Um, and so across the board, in the occupied West Bank, Jerusalem and 48 Palestine, in Gaza, Palestinians, in addition to the genocide that's happening in Gaza, it's not limited to, you know, though Gaza is being bombarded into oblivion, the genocide of the Palestinian people, um, while most deeply felt in Gaza, is not limited to Gaza. Um, you know, many Palestinians say it's been a slow genocide and, and a slow ethnic cleansing that's been happening for 75 years. Now we're just seeing that sped up to a, a degree um, that many people couldn't have imagined. Um, but in addition to the bombardment, there are so many of these stories of torture, of abuse, of political prisoners, of hostages. Um, that I think in the fog of war and with all the things that are happening and all the updates that we get constantly, a lot of these, you know, kinds of stories um, maybe fall through the cracks. Um, but some of the stories that we've talked about today are, are really important um, engaging and understanding the full picture of, of what is happening and what's being carried out right now against the Palestinian people. Well, uh, Yumna uh, Patel, thank you so much. And everyone should follow her on Twitter and also follow Manda Weiss. Um, and uh, I really want to, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. So, guys, everyone, where are we in likes? We better be, you better, I better have a lot of likes because this has been a really good um, stream so far. So, uh, Let's see. How are we on likes? Someone tell me how many how many likes we have. Let's see. Katie, please make it stop. Oh, please let everyone get everyone to meet each other halfway. Yeah, I 
I don't know how to do that. But um, yeah, this is, I mean, what we're just trying to make sure that people know about this. Um, how many likes do I have? Please tell me it's not 83. 641. Oh, really? That's great. Okay, awesome. Um, this is not vanity. This is me wanting to make sure that uh, the we beat the algorithm because when you have stuff like this, it's kind of suppressed and we want to make sure that people are hearing about what's happening. That's why uh, uh, it's so important. Okay. So I'm going to bring on our final guest. And again, give this a thumbs up, please share it on social media. And our final guest is a uh, return guest, um, Sam Yule Biagetti. He is a historian and the host of the podcast, Historian Explaining. And um, he is uh, going to talk to us about some of the most historically charged stories of 2023 and also about uh, the history of Zionism. So welcome, Samuel. Sam. Hi. Hi, Katie. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me on again. And, yes. Uh, and thank you for your patience. Oh, no problem. I mean, it's hard to follow uh, such a harrowing report like we got yeah. from Yumna. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if anything I say will be more uplifting following that, but, yeah. but we'll see. Well, uh, yeah, tell you, you had already prepared some of the big stories that um, you want to talk about. Um, also, I forget, I meant to tech to send you this thing. Did you see this clip about um, uh, uh, with a, 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 a father, Edward Beck, a religious commentator? talking about uh, Jesus being a Palestinian Jew? Uh, no, I didn't see that. Okay. Well, we can, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the history of Zionism? Do you want to start with some Christmas related history? I mean, I suppose maybe we should start with Zionism. I mean, okay. it's the big elephant in the room right. uh, and it was in the title. True. Um, so yeah, we can talk Thanks about that. Thanks for keeping me honest. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about that as much as as much as you'd like. And then if you want, get to other things. It's totally right. up to you. I know you've been doing a marathon here. So <laughs> Yeah. Oh no, but I'm very excited to talk to you. So Yeah. So um, you know, I, I actually a few years ago I wrote an article that was ended up in American Affairs about Judaism and Zionism in America. And Part of what I tried to say was that Zionism is kind of becoming more and more all pervasive and entrenched in American Judaism. And part of why I think that has happened is because most Jewish people today don't have a lot of connection to like traditional Jewish life ways. The Yiddish language is, you know, on its way out. Yiddish theater and the press, and Jewish radical politics. A lot of these things have faded since, you know, basically from the Second World War to now. And uh, I think Zionism and the attachment to Israel has kind of been used to fill the vacuum. And it's how a lot of people express their Jewishness and their attachment to the Jewish people is through support for Israel. And I think that's part of why it's so emotionally charged and it's mm. so hard to say anything, to have any perspective about it, right? Because people, as we've seen, people have conflated Judaism or Jewishness with Zionism to the point that if you question the logic of Zionism or the state of Israel, you're seen as um, a traitor, right? A traitor to, to the Jewish people. And, you know, it's a very uh, difficult, strenuous situation, really for, for anyone, but especially for, for any Jews like you or me who question this kind of pervasive, hegemonic uh, viewpoint. But it's also, I think, you know, as we can see, there's, there's also a turning point happening now where there is a critical mass and, you know we'll see if anything good comes to this current disaster. But I do think one thing that's happening is that uh, people, people are waking up and seeing that Jewish people don't all think alike. You know, we don't all sign on to this, uh, this agenda, much less even, even many Zionists, to be fair, don't 
accept what Israel is doing, the mass killing, the, you know, the punitive bombing, uh, the mass imprisonment. Uh, but there's kind of the, that middle point, I think, is eroding, right? And mm. to some degree, there there's always been a liberal Zionism, right? Mm. Uh, but it's getting harder and harder, I think, to maintain that position because uh, it's it's shrinking within Israel. And there's this countervailing logic that if you want the state of Israel to exist, this is the sort of things it's going to do. Right. right? This is this is part of how a state like Israel maintains itself. And it's very evocative. I don't know if maybe you've seen the Battle of Algiers about Algeria. Mm -hmm. You know, there you see torture, mass imprisonment by the French regime, and you see violence back, you know, from the Algerian revolutionaries as well. And a lot of people in France are saying, can't we be nicer about this? We don't like the torture. We don't like the imprisonment without trial. And a French general just says, well, look, if you want France to rule Algeria, these are the sort of things we're going to have to do. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, wake up and smell reality. And I think a lot of people right now are at that kind of crossroads right now of like, can you accept this or can you not? And if not, you're going to have to accept the ramifications of that, right? So that's all just preliminaries, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, do you want me to go back? I've been looking some and researching some more about the origins of Zionism yeah. and kind of the early evolution. Yeah. So yeah, if you'd want to- I know that something that I, I find fascinating is that I always assumed, not always, I, re I, I thought that- Christian Zionism was a more recent phenomenon and something I learned just reading um, Ilan Pape's uh, 10 Myths on Israel was how much older Christian Zionism is. It's not just a Pat Robertson evangelical right wing phenomenon. Um, yeah, I mean, it has roots going at least back to the Protestant Reformation, you know, and that it's long been part of sort of Christian eschatology, that there will be a regathering of the Jews. and then there will be a conversion, right? That all or most or some of the Jews will then convert and accept Christ. And that will be kind of the last step then towards the second coming. So there's always been this kind of background, you could say, of Christian Christian Zionism, right? But to, to Jewish people, the general thought right up until the 19th century, the general thought was uh, we have this ancient attachment to Jerusalem and the Holy Land, uh, but it is not in our power to, to have the Holy Land or to return there en masse until there's a Messiah, right? Uh, the, uh, and Messiah in, in Jewish thought, Messiah just means a leader of the Jews, right? A king of the Jews, not necessarily a divine figure. And so this was a central part of, of Judaism was that we uh, wait for the Messiah, right? We, and one should not jump the gun. In fact, a lot of rabbis taught, you know, it's, it's kind of blasphemous to say we can go back and retake the Holy Land uh, because that's, that's not for us to do, right? There's an arrogance there. And this thinking changed starting very slowly in the mid 1800s, which was the time of rising nationalism in Europe, where more and more the, the, the idea in vogue was that the sovereignty of the state derives from the organic unity of the folk or the nation. And that presents certain issues then for the Jewish minority in Europe, where some of them say, well, we are part of the, the nation, the folk, we are German, or we are Polish, or we are Italian, or whatever, and people served in the military and government. But then some said, well, okay, we're doing all those things. And some very assimilated Jews in places like Vienna and Budapest, who spoke the, the national language, who saw themselves as fully part of the society and of their nation, they weren't being fully accepted and fully treated as equal. And so they sort of flipped the logic on its head and said, well, we Jews are a nation. We have this sort of organic unity, a shared 
culture and ancestry and even blood. Many of them used these terms like blood or race. And therefore, we should have a nation state, the same as the Germans or the French or the Italians. We should have our own nation state. And that then combined with another stream of more, more religious Jews who wanted to go back to Palestine, to go back to the Holy Land, and who said, uh, you know, it's time, and sometimes spoke about the Messiah, a coming Messiah. And so sometimes these two things, these sort of two elements of what we come to call Zionism came together of, we need a nation state of our own. That's the only way we'll ever be equal. It's the only way we'll be modern. And our nation state should be in Palestine because we have this sort of historical religious claim to Palestine. And the sort of the first person to really propagandize and put out this, this message was Theodor Herzl, who was very much a, a secular and assimilated Jewish man from Budapest. He went to university in Hungary. He spoke German. He loved German history, German literature. He, he really wanted to be fully embraced in Vienna, right? In which was the capital of culture and literature. And when he was sort of held at arm's length and there was rising racism, scientific racism, scientific anti-Semitism in Vienna, then he sort of snapped and said, no, I, I want to have a Jewish nation state. And people like him, highly modern, highly assimilated, worldly Jews, would be the natural elite, right, of this Jewish nation state. And a lot of the early Zionist project, it was not just about let's take our people to Palestine and take over. It was also about abolishing what he saw as the backwardness of Jewish life, right? The Jewish folk, the, the, the shtetl, the, the Yiddish. It was about rejecting that and saying that is primitive, that is backwards. We're going to be modern people. We're going to have a modern state like Germany, like France, like Britain, and take our place, right, with dignity among the nations of the world. And it was easy, of course, to, to think this way and to imagine this. This was a really, you know, this was a pretty nutty idea in, when he published this book in, 19, in 1896, uh, Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state. This was a far-fetched idea, but it was possible to think this way because of the nationalist assumptions of that time and also because Palestine was a province under the rulership of the Ottoman Empire. And so Herzl's thinking and his followers was, uh, we can just buy it. Like, <laughs> we can just literally pay some money to the Ottoman emperor and they'll just give us Palestine. Like, like it's a piece of real estate to be bought and traded, right? And of course, the, the failure here is to think, well, if you subscribe to this nationalist ideology, then why don't the people of Palestine likewise have the right to self-determination and to control their country and have their own state? That, that logic just sort of bounced off, right? And there was this assumption that we're modern people, we can run a state, the Palestinians are just primitive, you know, peasant folk, and they're, they're not capable, and we don't have to respect any sort of claim that they might have to Palestine, we can just assert our own and basically take it, right? And that's that's the place where this whole process starts, right? And he publishes this book in 1896, and it gradually takes off from there and little by little becomes a movement. But, but at every stage, it's contested, right? Not only by Palestinians, right, who <laughs> are alarmed and saying, who are these foreign people just showing up? I mean, Many Jewish migrants also were welcomed and and coexisted in Palestine with people of different faiths and but at a certain point they they kind of put two and two together and said this is a movement of people trying to take over this country right create a but create a demographic majority not yeah that was right that right and that was the ultimate goal and it took a very long time it took more than fifty years and it took a lot of support from Europe, especially from Great Britain. So when the Ottoman Empire falls apart, the League of Nations just assigns Palestine as a mandate, basically a euphemism for a colony, and transfers it to, to Britain. 
And Britain and France, France have a huge role in all of this as well. They, they saw the Ottoman Empire was declining and their basic thinking was, uh, great, let's get in there quick and carve up everything we can and get it into our sphere of influence. And in the middle of World War I, I don't know how much you want to get into all this, <laughs> but, but uh, to try to be brief, the Ottoman Empire was involved in World War I. It was kind of like their last stand. And the British reached out to the, the Arabs, the, the um, you know, Muslim, largely Arabic speaking people of the Near East and said, let's make an alliance and fight against the Ottomans. And the implication was when the war is over, we've defeated the Ottomans, you'll have independence. Now, secretly, the British actually turned to the French and said, obviously, we're not going to honor that. We're going to divide the Near East up between ourselves. And they signed a secret treaty, the Treaty of Sykes-Picot, basically stabbing the Arab people in the back and saying, uh, when it's over, we're going to take Palestine and Jordan, and the French can have Lebanon and Syria. And that's how they ended up being mandates of Britain and France. And the British immediately, as soon as it looks like they're going to get control of Palestine, the British government issues the Balfour Declaration saying, we are going to support the eventual creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which was you know, very ambiguous, exactly what that meant. Did that mean an independent state? Did it mean all of Palestine? Nobody really knew. But they basically supported this Zionist movement to move more Jewish people into Palestine, such that by the 30s, it was, you know, maybe a quarter or so. Uh, it was several hundred thousand people in you know, a country that was still majority Muslim and Palestinian. And this basically they saw as a kind of beachhead that as long as Palestine was largely held by this Jewish uh, movement, it would be a trading partner. It would be part of the British sphere of influence, right? And like with so many things after the Second World War, the, you know, Britain's power in the world declines massively. And a lot of the sort of hegemonic uh, functions of Britain were just reassigned to the United States. And more or less since that time, the US has seen Israel as this sort of convenient outpost and extension of American power in, in the Middle East, right? And I think even Netanyahu a few years ago said, uh, Israel is a, a great aircraft carrier in the Middle East for Western civilization, <laughs> right yeah. there. It's a, it's a projection of European and American power into the Middle East. And that's not, of course, to say that's all it is. It's a very complex society. Uh, but that is basically why the US very quickly took a positive supportive role towards Israel. And since that time, there's been this kind of constant uh, campaign, right, to indoctrinate basically Americans and especially Jewish Americans to see Israel as a kind of extension of America right? That they're, they're the only democracy in the Middle East, our only ally in the region, et cetera, et cetera. And to present this kind of very manicured image of Israel as basically just like you, right? It's, it's just like an American suburb transplanted <laughs> or, yeah. or more fun, right? You know, think of the way people talk about Tel Aviv, right? It's like a piece of Los Angeles or something transplanted into the Middle East. Um, so that that takes us up to recent times, but there's a lot more about the evolution of of Zionism and also how Zionism, like all nationalist movements, Zionism depends on cultivating an image of this this organically unified people, right? And kind of homogenizing the people, imagining them to all be blood related. Uh, there's this kind of implicit biological nationalism behind it. And it depends on creating a mythology, right? Uh, creating a, a sort of mythic history. And as I always say, when, when you say something is a myth, it doesn't necessarily mean it's false. It can be true or false or a mix of both, right? But if we think about the way 
people talk about the sort of popular understanding of Jewish history that we have now, it is a mythology that more or less was created by the Zionist movement. And it begins with this proposition that the Jewish people are, are like a nation, which already from the beginning is very questionable, right? For one thing, the whole idea of a nation really only came up with the, in the French Revolution, right? The idea of a, a national state rooted in, in this uh, shared singular people with a single language and a single origin, a single root. That's a very modern post-French Revolution idea. And the Jewish people go back a few thousand years before that, right? right. <laughs> There's been a lot of change and evolution and movement. And it's, it's really, uh, it doesn't fit. It's putting a square peg in a round hole to talk about the Jewish people as a nation or to imagine, and therefore to imagine there could be a Jewish nation state. It doesn't make sense. You know, there are Jewish communities all around the world that have very different folkways, different vernacular languages, traditions, different politics, and that are not like may have some shared ancestry, but not necessarily that much. And, you know, I, I often say genetics is like the phrenology of our time. Right. Like you can take any set of people. You could say like, let's talk about Presbyterians or let's talk about people from Missouri and take a bunch of genes from them and find that there's some degree of genetic commonality among them. But that doesn't mean there's some kind of inherent or like racial or blood difference yeah. between people from Missouri and people from Kansas, right? There's always shades of difference and you can find something. You pick out any set of people, you can find some genetic variation that's a bit more common among those people than their neighbors, right? And if you do this with Jewish people, it gets crazy because number one, the first time that a scientific team, it was in 2000, was the first time a scientific team in Israel said, we've done this broad genetic study of Jewish people and we found some sort of commonality, right? It's not, not shocking, right? Again, you can find something among any group. And so there's some degree of shared genetic background, genetic material. If you talk about Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe and Sephardic Jews from the Mediterranean, but equally that same degree of commonality is also shared by Palestinians, right? If you're looking at these groups, broad groups as genetic pools, Jews and Palestinians are indistinguishable, right? And you have to do all kinds of trickery to somehow rearrange your data to get Palestinians out. If you were watching live, you got to see this whole thing, which you're so lucky. If you're watching this later and you want to see the full chat with Sam, where he gets into some really interesting uh, hard science. Yeah, some hard science and social science, some history and some genetics. Um, but not in a eugenicist way, then please become Patreon members at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Please like the show if you haven't. Please subscribe if you haven't. We're past 150,000 subs. Let's reach 200,000. Let's do it, fam. Um, please become Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And uh, I will see you guys in 2024. See you, uh, June, uh, see you January 2nd. We're going to have a great show on January 2nd and have a great new year. Okay. Bye everyone.